<laughs> and let's give a warm welcome to Derek Meyer. Okay, good. Um, so I did a, a talk, uh, I think it was, what, three months ago? Yeah, give or take. Uh, and that was on blockchain and cryptocurrency. Um, and so I went through a lot of the basics of what, what that is. In this talk, we're going to focus a little bit more on what a smart contract is. Uh, we'll go over some of the basics of blockchain, uh, but to, just to get a general feel, um, who here uh, is at all familiar with blockchain and or cryptocurrencies? Again, who here owns cryptocurrency? Nice. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so we're not going to really talk about cryptocurrency. We're not really going to talk about the value of anything. It's not a trading seminar or anything like that. This is more the, the tech sector of what uh, blockchain um, so, to get started here, oh, and then one other thing, like, if you guys have any questions, uh, you can stop me at any time, feel free to ask questions, I try to make things interactive when I'm talking, okay? Alright, so, first thing uh, that we'll go over is what is a blockchain? Um, so, blockchain is a, a, it's a technology for making uh, permanent digital records. Uh, different blockchains have different protocol on how uh, changes or updates are made. Um, the, uh, I'll show you on a slide on the, uh, the next slide. It's got a photo of how it works, and you'll see that in a sec. But basically, you can think of it as a, uh, a database or a place where information is stored. Um, and it's generally powered through a network of computers. Uh, those of you that are familiar with cryptocurrency, you'll know that those are called miners. Um, and they work towards solving problems to update the digital records. And thus, whenever they update the digital record, they produce a new block. And so after you have a new block, you start to get a chain of blocks, hence the word blockchain. It looks something like this. Uh, so this is Bitcoin's blockchain. Um, you can tell because of the, the timing of it. Uh, each block on the Bitcoin blockchain is, uh, is 10 minutes long. So you can see over here, like this would be where we're at right now at block 157, and then the previous block, 156, all the way down through. Um, and so the way that it works is uh, with Bitcoin specifically is they have a, a ledger which shows who has what balances of Bitcoin. Uh, for example, uh, we can say that I had 10 Bitcoin and Danny has 50 Bitcoin, right? And that might be the accurate uh, ledger balances in block 150, uh, but then let's say I want to send Danny one Bitcoin uh, that then gets sent to the network and the update gets stored in this block to where in this block my balance now shows as 9 and he now has 51. Does that make sense on how that works? Okay, cool. Now the, the real key thing on why you would use a blockchain for something like this is that um, with each block that gets added, it makes the previous blocks harder to um, harder to mess with or tamper with. So the information that's further uh, further back is more and more secure. Uh, this is especially nice when it comes to uh, two smart contracts, but also with Bitcoin. If uh, Let's say that we're at block 157 and back at block 150, I had 100 Bitcoin and I spent all of it between here and there. Uh, you might want to say, okay, great. Well, I want to go back to when I had 100 Bitcoin and just kind of make a little side thing going here. The, the problem with doing that is you have to have more computing power to generate all these other blocks, because these are all linked to the previous block. And that makes sense on how that works? Okay, cool. Good. Uh, so that's what a blockchain is. Now, with smart contracts, you can store smart contracts in a block, and thus, uh, same thing. If you wanted to alter or adjust your contract, um, it would just be near impossible to do so. Um, of course, you can write in the contract different negotiation points. Um, but we'll, we'll get there in the next slides. Um, so what is a smart contract? It's a self-executing uh, contract that's stored on a blockchain. Uh, the parties involved in the contract agree to the parameters of the contract, and then they deploy it to the blockchain. So it actually lives somewhere, lives somewhere in here. Um, after it's deployed, the execution of the contract occurs when various events or triggers happen uh, to trigger the next steps of the contract. And I'll show you an example of what this is. But this basically automates the whole process. 
Um, and then the language inside of a, a contract is usually a lot of if-then statements. So you could say, if blank occurs, then do this. So if Joe buys a car, then transfer the ownership or transfer the title to Jeff. He just bought it. Um, okay, good. So we'll go through an example of what it's like uh, to write a contract. Now, I'm going to use the example of buying a house. Uh, primarily because when, and if there's any realtors in here, I didn't include every step on buying a house, but just a general feel so you can see how it works, okay? Um, but like when you're buying a house, um, you know, you go through an escrow company where you have the, the buyer, they submit their earnest money to the escrow company, the escrow company holds on to those funds until all, everything else on the sale of the house is completed, and then they issue the funds. Uh, but in Oregon, an escrow company costs on average uh, 500 to a thousand dollars just for them to literally hold your money and be a trusted person so that you don't run into the problem of uh, you know you have you have something and someone else has money and you're trying to go like, who gets it first you know what I mean uh, so that's where a smart contract comes into place so this is what it would look like so uh, obviously with the logic of it and these are very uh, uh, logical contracts so you have to go through each point of, of logic and put that into the code. Uh, so obviously you have a seller that wants to sell his house, uh, and then you have a buyer that comes in during an open house or something, looks at the house, says, great, I'm going to make an offer. At that point, that's where you would actually start the smart, smart contract. Uh, so the buyer submits an offer, he can do that with a smart contract, with the terms of the sale stated in the contract. Uh, terms of the sale being, you know, length of the inspection time, how long uh, he wanted before it closes, uh, who the lender is, who the appraiser is, all the information about it. Um, so he would submit that to the seller, then uh, if the seller accepts that contract, uh, then the contract would go on to step two. Uh, in step two, the buyer would apply for financing uh, to get his mortgage loan. Uh, if the buyer is pre-approved uh, for the sale price stated in the contract, uh, then go on to step three. Step three says uh, the buyer puts down his earnest money. So you can literally send money to the contract and then it holds it there until either completion or cancellation of the contract. Once the funds are sent to the contract, then you go to step four. Uh, step four starts the inspection period. Uh, it gives an expiration of two weeks. So that's what you said uh, in the initial offer. Uh, the buyer would have to schedule the inspections of the property. Now here you have some conditions on what can happen. You could have, um, you know, the inspections come back saying that there's problems with the windows that have to be repaired, and then he wants to negotiate the price. Uh, so if that occurs, then the buyer would send an updated offer. Uh, otherwise, if, uh, which, how many of you in here are developers or people studying programming or know anything about programming? Okay, cool. Good. So otherwise, you could have an LF statement in the contract. Uh, if the buyer is pleased with the inspection results and wants to continue at the current price, uh, then move on to step five. So that's a, a secondary option. Um, or you could have the option if neither of the above two options are applicable, right? The buyer decides not to proceed with the purchase of the home, maybe because the roof is caving in and there's you know rats in the basement and mold growing everywhere, whatever. Uh, then you can cancel the offer, or in this case, cancel the contract. Um, oh yeah. So in this, uh, let's just assume that he went with the current sale price, and we move on to step five of this contract. Okay, so then the appraisal schedule. Um, and this is something that the, the contract could automatically, once going to step five, you know, send a notification to the appraiser, because we already stated who that is, get it scheduled, uh, to go out and check the value of the home. Um, the appraiser would then submit the, his appraised value of the home uh, to the contract. Now, if the appraised value satisfies the buyer's uh, lending criteria, then you would move on to step six. Uh, if the appraised value does not satisfy the lending criteria, uh, the buyer can either uh, put down a larger down payment uh, and come up with his own, you know, his own funds, uh, or if the buyer just can't get approved for financing at this point and the appraised for too low, cancel the contract. So you have all kinds of different cancellations in there uh, as you're going through the process. Uh, but let's assume that the appraised value uh, does satisfy the buyer's lending criteria, goes on to step six. Um, so now with lending approved um, and all the inspections are done, everything looks good to go, uh, 
uh, the lender then sends the remaining funds to the contract. This would get sent to the seller, and then the title would transfer from the seller over to the buyer, because he just bought the house. And all of this is just an automated process. So once, once an event occurs and it's notified to the blockchain, uh, then the contract will just move on to the next step. Uh, now, uh, one of the nice things about doing this on a blockchain, let me scroll back up to that one, um, is you would then have the, uh, the purchase of this home stored on a blockchain. Um, which some information, uh, or I would say a majority of information, is encrypted, so you can't just go in and look in everyone else's lives and you know, dig around for whatever you want. Um, but you could prove, uh, by giving like a password to unlock the encryption, you could prove, like, yeah, back in block 151, uh, I bought this house, and here's how much it bought for, it. and these were the inspection results, and you can have all of the information uh, built into here. Uh, or <coughs> five years down the line, you wanted to sell a house, you could show someone, hey, here it is. And they know that they don't have to just trust your word because you said so. This is all information that has gone through an appraiser, gone through the inspection companies, and all of that was submitted. Does that all make sense? Cool. Any questions so far? Okay. Go ahead. Question. Yeah? So on who's holding the money effectively, how does it then sell it without starting another one? Good. Uh, so the, the money would be sent to to the contract. So the, the money is actually stored in the blockchain. Um, and then once everything is finalized, then you would, uh, at that point, it would transfer the money to the seller. The, now the problem was stored in the blockchain? Who's holding the, the, the app? Yeah, the app, the contract, wherever it is. The service making the service. Exactly. Now the, the thing that would stop the seller from submitting another contract is he doesn't actually get the funds until step six, where, uh, yep, the lending is now approved. Step six, it transfers the title, and he gets the funds. So if he no longer has the title because another contract was built, he wouldn't get funds from another contract anyway. Yeah, but that doesn't prevent him starting the contract. Yeah, not necessarily. I mean, there would, there would have to be other clauses that you could put in there by saying, like, okay, great, you know, with this offer, you're going to agree that you're not going to accept any other offers. Um, but with the way that the protocol works, um, he wouldn't be able to try to sell his house to two different people because he has only one title for the house. Yes, but it doesn't uh, prevent him from starting the contract. Yes. Yeah. He still owns the title. Yeah, yeah, and, and you. You would probably put in there that the, um, you know, that he wouldn't be able to start another contract. Like that would be part of your agreement with the person. Yeah, but like who's ensuring this? This part of the clause. Yeah, totally. That would be between the buyer and the seller. They would put that in their contract. Um, there's other, uh, not to get too complex, but there's other forms of digital identity that a person can have. So you could have, you know, a person's identity in there to where you could. You can actually write, depending on the blockchain, that this identity is not able to create another contract <laughs> associated with this asset until completion of this contract. Which that would definitely be the smartest way to do that. Um, but, but yeah, there's a lot that could go into that. Does that make sense? Okay. So when you say that the funds are being held in the blockchain, um, yeah, that's cryptocurrency. Yeah. Generally speaking. Yeah, I don't, I don't know a way to put U.S. dollars yeah. into a contract, but you could very easily put uh, cryptocurrency into the contract. Cool. Any other questions? Um, okay, so last night I was, uh, I was going through all the different use cases. I had about four of them listed, but um, with my last talk that I gave, um, I had you know, maybe 30, 40 minutes worth of content, and then it went on for an hour and a half, so I was like, okay, I'm going to shorten this one down a little bit. Um, but just a, a couple other example of use cases is uh, I was reading an article the other day of someone who wants to use smart contracts for purchasing a plane ticket. Uh, so you go to their website, you buy a plane ticket, and then they send you some type of a, a token or a ticket that you use to uh, you know, board the plane. You know, similar to like when you go to, when you go to the airport, you see people scan their phones, that gets them on the plane. 
but in this contract you can put in other clauses, such as you know if the airplane is two hours late, then um, you know return or refund twenty five dollars to each passenger, and you can have all of that built into um, you know into the purchase of the plane ticket. Another really useful uh, use case is you know pretty much with anything in the insurance industry. Uh, if you take a look at life insurance, you have someone who pays monthly premiums, once they die, and then death benefit given to uh, whoever they need as a beneficiary. Um, all of that could be something that would be automated in the process of a smart contract. Um, so, you know, a person would pay their premiums, you would name who the beneficiary is. Uh, once the person has a reported death, then that would get sent, you know, to the blockchain, and then the funds would just automatically transfer. So you wouldn't need to have long waits in between uh, different steps. No, I have a question. Sure. So, <clears throat> like the line should um, can touch the plane ticket. So, is this one uh, limit only in the U.S. or it can be around the world? Everybody oh, in the world. It could be around the world. I mean, like if, if you were writing a contract, you probably want to know who who the company is and who the you know who the client would be, um, or if you're doing business to business, what the two two parties would be. Um, but yeah, I mean that's something that you, is usable anywhere. Like live insurance, you can limit only U.S. customer, but uh, a plane ticket you can let everybody in the world can buy. Right? Yeah, but obviously, you know, if you live in in Jamaica, you're not going to want to buy a plane ticket from England to France. <laughs> yeah. So like you'll you'll kind of know who your who your clients are for the most part. Maybe he buy it for his cousin or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, good. Another one that, that I was thinking of as I was walking down here is, um, you know, with the whole uh, private practitioners and doing insurance pay, uh, they have to submit all of this information um, to request from the insurance company that they get paid for the work that they do, uh, which is a whole headache. Any of you guys have ever talked to your dentist or private practitioner, you know that they hate that side of their job. Uh, but that's something that would be pretty simple to automate. Um, you know, with a smart contract. I would, I would guess that it would be pretty difficult to get implemented with insurance companies because they move, you know, relatively slowly. Uh, but you could have that process just fully automated so that the person gets the work done, they submit it, and then they instantly get paid uh, because of the way that the contract works. Does that all make sense? Again, any other questions so far? Yeah. So, to reverse a smart contract, like if I start Crisis 2.0 and, and everything's P2P with uh, smart contracts, yeah. and everything goes well going forward, but then I, my service offers a way to get refunds to go backwards, how do I go back? Do I need to go back to the first contract? Or do um, I need a new contract for a refund? Yeah, I mean, for a refund, you'd want to put that, uh, that actual code into the contract, saying, you know, just having a line in there that if for some reason the you know, within 30 days, the customer is not satisfied with the product or whatever it is, uh, then issue a refund. So you want to put that into the contract because once it's on the blockchain, uh, it's very difficult to go back in time. Um, you know, if not near impossible, to go back in time and adjust previous uh, renditions. Uh, the other thing that's that's uh, did, did that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, cool. The other thing that's nice about it is that um, when you upload a smart uh, contract to the blockchain, you can actually reuse it. Um, so taking the example of um, you know of the health insurance, if you had a contract for um, you know let's just say doing dental cleaning, right, and the person has X Y Z health uh, dental insurance company, um, you could put a, a pre-made contract template in the blockchain, and then you could just call it, uh, put in the various inputs of the person's name, their uh, their care ID whatever other information is necessary to identify them. And then you could list the work, it would automatically check their system based off of their, their schedule and see if you know, they were covered for that. And if they were covered, you could immediately send uh, funds to the dentist. Make sense? Okay, cool. Would those templates be older blocks that you can add to, or do they have to be the latest? Well, the template would just be stored on the blockchain. And so you could call that template and then uh, put in whatever inputs that you would need because you need to change information in it, whether you know, the person's name or 
what house you're buying or what plane ticket you're getting. So you can modify an old <coughs> block as long as it was written to be modified. Exactly. Yeah, you could write a template that would then allow you to put in uh, various raw inputs. But you can even control it further to say, like, okay, great. We want, we want them to be able to say what the names of the parties are, but we don't want them to be able to change this part of the language. So, um, yeah, so there's certain things that you can say. Okay, great. This is a, you know, an input section where you say something about the person, but the language is all written the same. Makes sense. Yep. Going back to the uh, host notes for the example. Yeah. Uh, let's say we didn't have a contract. Uh, the contractor comes in and does the homes, and then uh, I release the funds. Everything goes well. Six months down the line, uh, I see some issues with the homes. Then, how do I pull back the amount once he has redeemed the amount? Once he has pulled out the amount, how do I get back anything out of it? You know, that's a good question. Um, I have immediate thoughts would be putting in language into the contract, say, you know, if after a certain point, then uh, to renegotiate something. Like you could write language into your contract that would say if after you know, six months no further problems are found, then uh, at that point close out the contract. So you could put... You wouldn't be able to wait for, for six months for me to release the funds. I have to release Right. You could say release the funds and then still have the contract going and then after six months then uh, stop the contract. So you could release the funds at any point in the if you wanted to write the contract where after the inspections are done, then you'd release the funds, you could do that. That would just be written down. But I mean, in the real world, when you buy the house, one the inspection done, you know, and when you go to the title, it's a done deal. You can yeah. get back. Yeah, exactly. So Yeah, in the real term, right? Yeah, which in the, you know, in the smart contract, it, it says, you know, when the inspections are done, and yeah. assuming that they passed and you're happy with the price, yeah. and the appraisal's done, and if appraised it for enough, then at that point, transfer funds and transfer title, yep. which those two steps occur together. Yeah, like six months later, you find out something wrong with the house, no? You had to go to the title, or you had to go to court, or whatever. Yeah, but basically, which, I'm done. Yeah. yeah, which you obviously could go to court and just do the same things that we do nowadays, um, but it is something that you could write into the contract. You could do like a take back almost. So if the contract was still running for six months, it still has access to the seller's uh, account. And if the condition is satisfied that we've agreed that I need to transfer money back, then it can do the take back. Yeah, and you'd want to figure out exactly what the language would be, but you could write something in there, like let's just use uh, <coughs> sale price of $300,000. And then at the point of sale, um, you know, 280 of it becomes accessible to the person, and the other 20 is kind of held there. You could do something like that. I don't think that in practice would work very well, but there's all kinds of different things that you could write into your contract. So you could say, uh, you know, to answer the original question, you could say transfer funds, then, you know, after a six month period or after a 12 month period or whatever, at that point, end the contract. And if, if no further issues, end the contract. Uh, going back to Sorry, I'm stretching this problem. Sure. Uh, let's say 300,000. I release the 300,000. They can take out the 300,000. But after that, let's say my client issues. There's no way that I can uh, get that 20,000 again. Is that right? So there's, the contract is still on, but then I release the funds. They've taken out the funds. Yeah, and currently, currently that is the way that it's set up. Like currently, we would probably have to go through the court system. But eventually, you know, if a person has a digital identity, um, where um, you could say, okay, great, this digital identity per this contract, you know, owes me twenty thousand um, dollars. You know, even if they took the funds out of out of their wallet, uh, next time that they put funds in the wallet, could automatically garnish them or take them. Okay. Yep. Makes sense. You can also buy insurance for those types of issues, so that'd be another way to like limit the buyer and seller complexity and liability moving yep. forward. Actions. Yep. Just move the risk to an insurance company and then get a payout from the insurance company if you find the issue. Yes. Yep. I mean, uh, in the real world, after you sell the house, you done deal, and six months or a year later, you find something wrong with the house or the title, you had to go to the title company. Yep. Or uh, something wrong with your house, you had to go to the insurance company. Yep. Yeah, because the 
person sell you four hundred thousand dollar, they just want four hundred thousand dollar. They don't want only oh, I get uh, three hundred fifty thousand dollar and fifty thousand. They stay in the title for insurance. No, no way. Yeah, they, yeah. Get, they, they get you sell four hundred thousand dollar. They get four hundred thousand dollar. After that, something wrong. You just go to the title insurance, whatever you know. That in the real world. Yeah. There's a lot of things coming together, and I'm trying to get my head around how the technology works. So we have the we have the blockchain, which is the storage of data, yeah. and it's immutable past the most current. Right. And we have a smart contract, which is basically an application that's writing or extract or using data that's in those chain, in the blockchain. Yeah. Okay. So, and then we have cryptocurrency, which is a way to exchange value. Yeah. So it's like those three things are coming together in the buy the house, that Yeah, okay. exactly. So so the the question I have is the application has access to all the blocks. So if I write an application, I could say go look at go look for some identity in some house ID anywhere in the blockchain and find the last time it, there was a transaction. Yeah, you could write that. Okay, or you already go, okay, now I'm looking up that record, and there's the record of the house. Yep. Was it purchased? Yeah. So I could write all that in the smart in the smart contract with write without writing anything to the blockchain. Right. Okay. Then I could run some logic that could go, somebody executed an exchange of cryptocurrency, write that to the blockchain. Yeah. And that would just be a new version of that contract in the next block. So the so the contract just kind of gets updated and recreated each time an interaction with it happens. Yeah. Regardless of whether you're exchanging cryptocurrency or not, that's just another that's just another function in the blockchain. Right? Yeah, and really one of the one of the crypt, uh, biggest functions that cryptocurrency has in this is that obviously when you have computers that are running, um, you know, to support the network that you know requires machine power, which uses energy. That people have to pay for, and so the cryptocurrency one, you know, pays the people to support the network, and two, uh, with most contracts, um, in order for it to fulfill, that also requires energy, and so you would have to pay a small fee to to make sure that your contract can go through, um, because you run into the problem uh, in programming of an infinite loop, and what would happen if you have a contract that just has an infinite loop? Well, the cryptocurrency that you put into the contract to say, okay, good, this is how much you're going to have in order to run the contract. Um, for every, you know, every piece of information that it's storing, it's using some of that, the, the cryptocurrency that you put in to run the contract. And then eventually that'll run out. And if there's an infinite loop, it'll definitely run out. So the, the cryptocurrency is used as an incentive to pay for computers to get on the network and to do transactions. Yeah, exactly. So that you get paid join this and perform transactions. That's right. It's also a charge for using the system. Right. Mm -hmm. So if I want to run a contract, I have to pay some currency. Yes. Regardless of what currency might be exchanged in my contract. Right. Just by being on the network, I have to pay a little bit. Yeah. And, and then, then I get paid a little bit if I run the transaction. Yeah. So like if I'm if I'm supporting the network and you want to write a smart contract, you would pay the network a small fee in order for the contract to be fulfilled. That would then go to me because I'm fulfilling your contract. Okay. So that's where that comes. Then to. there's some off network or off blockchain process where I can buy currency or whatever. Where I give you actually U.S. dollars and yes. you say, okay, I'm assigning you a hundred thousand crypto coins or tokens or whatever. Yep. But that's off. Well, that could be recorded in the blockchain. Yeah. There's a lot of ways right. that that can run. Okay. Um, with with uh, with Crypto Vault, which is uh, the startup that I'm working on. Uh, it's a digital wallet. Now, uh, we did a lot of research into how some of that works. Um, said I wasn't going to talk too much about cryptocurrency, but I'm going to diverge into it just for a second. But yeah, you can send someone uh, funds, uh, whether it's on the blockchain, or you can send someone funds off the blockchain. For example, uh, with Coinbase, if you and I both have a Coinbase account, Coinbase just has their internal database of who has what. And if I went to go send you one Bitcoin, their internal database would, would update. Now, if you then wanted to send someone else cryptocurrency, that would get broadcast into the network. Uh, let's say they had a completely different wallet. Um, that's something that would go on the blockchain. But our, our transfer, just because it was an internally done, 
for Coinbase wouldn't necessarily hit the blockchain. So, so like every time we write a contract, we put into like Ethereum network, we had to pay the fee, right? Yes. So you know how much the fee right now? Uh, it's, you know, pennies. <laughs> it's, it's not expensive. Yeah. It's <laughs> not a couple of dollars. Yeah, especially compared to, you know, in the example of buying a house, you know, escrow fees being, you know, $500,000. You know, overall, it's like, okay, you know, I'm buying a $300,000 house, $500, whatever. But, you know, over time, that does kind of add up. So, so right now, it's probably a penny to put a contract. Uh, I would say pennies, probably in the range of 2 to 17. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, what, about, what about someone uh, using the example of Joe buying the car? Sure. If Joe bought a used car and, to, and using his digital identity for the transfer, uh, he, he's not going to abandon his identity because, let's say, it's just a cheap used car that he's buying. Sure. But when you're talking about a house and you're talking about a significant amount of money, yeah. uh, it, there's a, it is, have you heard of any cases where someone just walks away from their digital identity because they have the money, they don't want to return it, they're, sure. just, they're just skipping out? Yeah, it's a good question. Really, this is such a new technology that um, you know, the process of having a digital identity isn't, isn't totally in place. This is something that the that the technology is moving towards, and there's a lot of different projects that are working on figuring out, like, okay, how do we calculate what's um, you know what's a reliable digital identity? You know, if you have a wallet and you can verify that this person you know has a, a smart contract for paying their rent for the next 12 months, and you can see, yeah, on the first of each month they paid their rent, that would give them some type of credibility. Um, and so there's there's different uh, different projects that are working on. Uh, how do you essentially make a credit score for a person based off of their reputation? And then you might not want to do transactions with someone who doesn't have very much reputation. But I, I would be concerned about, in, this, in a case like this, buying a house, a person might have an immaculate reputation, does everything right, relatively small amounts of money. But when you talk about something serious, a million dollar house, for example, sure. not, a person might not be as honorable. Yeah, totally. And that's that's the whole thing, is that you don't want to trust people. Um, or, I don't want to say you don't want to trust people. The way that the protocol is written is it's written in a way where you shouldn't have to trust people. Um, you know, in this example specifically, when the buyer um, when the buyer is submitting their funds to the contract, then it basically store, uh, lives there. Once the funds are sent, then at that point, or once the funds are sent to the contract, at that point, the contract then sends the title to the buyer and the funds to the seller. So it, it operates on this system where you don't need to trust the seller, you just need to trust the protocol. And the well, I was more concerned like uh, the example you used before. There's something something seriously wrong with the house after it's been purchased, after the title has been transferred. But there's supposed to be a refund, the person's not going to give up that. The person's not going to give up that refund. The person's rather disappear. Right? Law, you know, you pick identities, and it's not like it's not like it solves all of the theft problems in the world. I mean, someone can still go rip somebody off. Well, so if you buy a house, to... you're still registered with the state, and the house is a known property, and you're not going to sell it to somebody who hasn't shown an ID card. Or yeah, but in the real world, there are protocols and there are examples. I was just wondering, in the digital world, yeah. where are we? Yeah, and it's it's yeah. something that I would say that. I, I personally haven't, um, you know, I haven't, I, my project isn't necessarily involved as much with smart contracts. It's something that I know about, but it's not something that I've worked too much in with crypto ball. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of answers that, that uh, probably exist on how to properly manage a digital identity um, so that you would be able to do those types of things. But, you know, it is something that is growing and expanding. So. Uh, it requires the you know innovative minds and, and people who are figuring out like okay how do we take all of these real world experiences write them into code so that it's something that's workable every time. Yeah. Um, I just kind of wanted to like share and maybe you might help um, explain it. Sure. Um, but the technology like it doesn't it does pretty much what already happens in the real world. It just makes it a lot easier. So for example, like when you buy a at the end, you might end up paying the broker ten thousand dollars, and you can, in, in comparison, writing a smart contract, you can, it costs you fifty cents. So that's kind of like the parallel, I guess. The contract is not with the broker. The the realtor. 
Yes, it's, it's different. It's just a place to ask for this. That's all. Yeah, and it just makes things easy. Like it, like now the way the system works, there's a lot of people in place that creates the trust system, and the t this like the technology pretty much allows that process to happen with the technology rather than like paying all these fees. Yeah, it's it like, only looks nice, guys. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean all right. It, it's only like replace. Uh, the title company you go in the box you buy the house involve a lot of stuff you have to get the credit score you have to get the bank approval because you when you buy the house you only put like 20 percent 20 percent down right you have to loan the money from bank of america or something and go with the title the razor all kind of stuff it takes like a month or two three months to get the house yeah yeah totally. yeah, yeah and, and, and it is exactly right this is something that's built towards automating you know, uh, the process of having to go through multiple people. It's just now like it's, a supplementation, a, like a, a lawyer can use the technology to make their job easier. Yeah. Yeah, it's not like going to replace lawyers and it's yeah. not going to, like, yeah. you know, replace a dentist. They will still have to work on your teeth. Well, but the identity systems, which is a, my company is working on a voting system. Okay. And so identity is huge. Yeah. And it, it's how you know that that person is a registered voter in that precinct. Right. Which is coming from a completely different data source. Right. And then you, you know, so we have offline processes to do that identification and then transfer them into an identity in the, in the blockchain. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I like what you said earlier. It's a data and storage mechanism and they get it in a crypto uh, uh, security. Right. So super, super secure data. Right, exactly. It doesn't solve all the problems outside, you know, of like you can do a handshake with someone you trust or not, you know, that stuff right. happens. Yeah, exactly. And and you know, voting systems is definitely a very popular use for smart smart contracts. Again, you do need to solve the digital identity. Um, but uh, that's you know another great example of like, you know, if we were to all in this room vote on whether we wanted cheese pizza or pepperoni pizza, you know, that could be something that is sent in to where you know, if, if Danny, the guy that was up here earlier, were to receive all those votes, cheese pizza might uh, outweigh pepperoni pizza. Uh, and Danny's like, well, you know, I really like pepperoni, so that's what we're going to get, right? And so we're all kind of trusting Danny that he's going to use the votes properly. Um, but with, a, you know, storing that information into uh, a blockchain, you can very easily see, like, hey, cheese got 18 votes and pepperoni only got 12. Why did we get pepperoni? Make sense? Okay, good. Um, good. Any other questions before I, I move on to the next part? Okay. This is really my, my last slide. One thing that I just wanted to go over because uh, I know we do have some, some students in the room, some people studying programming. Um, I highly, highly recommend uh, starting to learn how to write smart contracts. Uh, this is a skill that's something that very few people know how to do. Um, I believe that in Oregon there's uh, you know less than 100 people that are qualified to write an actual smart contract. Um, the the three that I wanted to touch on here is uh, there's the Ethereum blockchain, which was the first smart contract blockchain, and thus it's the largest one. Uh, and they have their own language that they write their contracts in. It's called Solidity, uh, and it's very similar to Python. If anyone's uh, studying Python. Uh, there's another one that's uh, a newer blockchain called EOS. Uh, their contracts are written in C, C++, uh, C Sharp, or Java. Um, stand out of the way so you can put yeah, it. Got it. Yeah. Um, that one, uh, it's, a, it's supposed to be a faster blockchain. You can do your own research into the differences between the different blockchains. Uh, but for those of you that are, uh, that are studying or already know, C Sharp, Java, uh, C or C++, EOS you know, is a great option. Uh, and lastly, Stratus is another blockchain uh, that uses smart contracts. Uh, it uses primarily C Sharp and is fully compatible with uh, the Microsoft.NET framework uh, at the school. You know, uh, they use a lot of C Sharp and Microsoft.NET, so I wanted to put that one in there as well. Very good. Uh, do you guys have any other questions for me? Anything I can help answer? Oh, I have a question. Sure. So, who teach the uh, language solidity? Solidity? That's yeah, something that it? you can learn online. If you oh. if you Google it, 
uh, if you have studied any Python, you'll notice a lot of similarities. Yeah. yeah, you can Google it. There's, um, you know, there's different tutorials and stuff online uh, that you can do, and uh, you can. It takes about um, you know 30 minutes or so, and you'll have you know your first real basic contract written. Yeah. Should they don't teach in like PCC or PSU or something like that? No, I don't think they teach them there yet. Uh, but you can find them online, and then uh, and I'm sure. You know, languages like this will become more and more popular once the actual implementation and utilization in the world is, you know, increased. Cool. Uh, there are like eight other hands that were raised. A question: the Python yeah. three, uh, Ethereum, EOS, and Stratus. Yeah. Which is the most often used uh, platform? Ethereum, by far. It was the first one, um, and so it's just kind of it has the largest, um, I guess, the largest user base. Um, one thing that happened though is back in, um, I think it was August or so. Um, do you guys remember Tamagotchis, those little like pocket pets? Okay, so on the Ethereum blockchain, they released these things called Crypto Kitties, and so you know you would have you know your own little Ethereum pet, uh, and it was you know dedicated to you, and it was you know linked to you and your your uh, Ethereum address. And you could essentially gift your crypto kitty to someone else. It kind of became a little bit like the uh, trading card game type of thing, um, but it you know got launched. Uh, There's a lot of contracts written as part of how that application works, um, and it kind of blew up and it clogged the system. And all of a sudden, you know, fees skyrocketed, and uh, and it just became kind of unworkable. Um, so, but they were the first people to really create a smart contract blockchain. So they're constantly learning and growing and developing. Uh, that's why there's a couple of uh, couple newer ones that are figuring out, like, okay, how do we scale this to where um, it can support, you know, millions of transactions per second, not just tens of transactions per second. For example, like uh, EOS, uh, they have a. Um, actually, I think I can just show this. To you. So this is an example of just a decentralized application that's used on the EOS blockchain. You guys ever played Space Invaders? So I just um, I scanned the QR code with my phone, and that now linked my phone to my computer screen. Mm -hmm. And from my computer screen, I can say go left. Oh well, I just lost. Very <laughs> good. So I can say go left, and it goes left, or I can say go right, and it goes right. Now each time I say go left, it notes. A transaction or uh, an action to the blockchain and says, "Send this ship linked to this phone to go left." Uh, transactions are completed uh, within 0.5 seconds. So then you can say, "Okay, good." Go right after I come back. Is this an app? Yeah. Cool. Well, this is this is a website, and then you just use your camera phone, scan the QR code, and then it'll take you it'll take you to a URL that links up to that exact. Um, that exact contract. So then you can play Space Invaders controlling from your phone onto the computer screen. Cool. Kind of fun, right? Yeah. And then we can look back at the blockchain and see all Yeah, you can see my high scores, you can see anything. This is this is kind of a, a test that they did just to like just to show people um, you know what type of things can be done using um, uh, using decentralized applications. Uh, it was kind of like a, for fun, like, hey, check this out. Look what you can do. Start thinking about what you guys want to build. Uh, it was made by the developer team for EOS. Yes? So these are in the, they're individual blockchains. So Ethereum is a, a single blockchain. Yes. So all of the dApps that are running and running, they all contribute to that same blockchain. Assuming that they're running the decentralized application on Ethereum. 
you could also uh, run it on the EOS blockchain, which is a totally different blockchain. Right. With different protocol, uh, for example, um, I could, um, in our earlier slide, we see that you know on this blockchain specifically, the time between blocks is about 10 minutes, right? <coughs> Uh, on that one that we just saw, it was 0.5 seconds. Because I said go left, 0.5 seconds later, my ship starts to go left. And I said go right, 0.5 seconds later, you know, the computers that were running that network mined my transaction, posted it to the blockchain, and then my ship started to go right. And so different different blockchains have different protocol. Um, but you don't create like your own Ethereum blockchain. Like the Linux Foundation does this hyperledger yep. blockchain where you actually create. Yeah, and you, you can create your own blockchain. You would just want to understand why you would do that as opposed to using an already existing blockchain. There, there are certain use cases where that is applicable, but um, it, I would say it's fairly few right now. But you don't do that with Ethereum or EOS or Shadows. Yeah. Those, you just write the apps and write to the, to the big one. Exactly. The public one. Right? Yeah, oh. that's right. So, I have a question. So, this one is a Bitcoin blockchain, right? That's right. And the Bitcoin blockchain doesn't have a smart contract. That's right. So why you put it here? Well, I put this in here just because this was the slide right after I said, what is a blockchain? Oh, I see. So this was just to understand that. I keep, I keep going back to it because it's nice to, nice to have a visual of like, hey, so this is a blockchain. Yeah. So that's, that's why I go back to this one. But yeah, that um, you know, each, each blockchain is different. They have different protocol on how things can be stored, uh, et cetera. Makes sense. Why do you say that they're more secure than part of the because it's nearly impossible to rewrite two blocks back, right? I mean, yeah, two blocks, two one blocks block back. You have to unravel the entire network to be able to do it. Yeah. Why do you Why do you say it gets more secure to go back? Uh, good question. It'll be kind of a long answer, but I think we have a little bit more time. Um, okay. Good. So basically, you know, the the miners, the people that are um, verifying transactions on the network. What they're doing is they're solving problems in order to figure out what's what's the correct key to unlock the new block. So then they figure out what that key is, and then they let everyone else know who's mining, like, hey, this is the proper key, right? It's, it's just a bunch of letters and numbers. Say, here's the proper code, try this, and then everyone tries it and they're like, oh yeah, that worked. Great. Then they all start working on solving the next block. Um, but uh, Whatever key is going to work for block 157 varies depending on what the key for block 156 was. And so each, each key depends on the previous block. So if you were back at block 152 and you wanted to make a new block 153, you would have to then verify all the same transactions and create the same blocks because you wouldn't be able to just go from block 152 and then take this information here and put it in. Because the because each block re, uh, relies on the previous block for the validity of it. So um, I'm not sure if that properly answered your question, but you would you would essentially need to be able to have more computing power than everyone who's currently writing blocks, which you would just have to have so much computer that you know that gets to be really expensive. Yeah. So that was what they talk about the 51 percent attack, right? That's what they're talking. Out. Exactly. So the idea is like, you, if you're forking off that blockchain, you need to be fast enough to catch up to the head. Exactly. The yeah, you would, side, right? yeah, you'd essentially need more computing power than everyone who's mining these blocks so that you could catch up. Because the blockchain autom automatically thinks with whatever the longest chain is, that's the one that's working. And so, um, yeah, you would need to have more computing power than everyone else in order to mine enough blocks to then be the longest blockchain. And if you were somehow Actually, be overriding blocks, you just sort of be hijacking the network. Exactly, yeah. So you'd become the most notable blockchain. Right. And everyone would start to trust you as the most yeah. over everybody else. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there was a term that was mentioned called the 51% attack. If you had at least 51% of the computing power on that blockchain, then you could essentially hijack it whenever you wanted. Uh, but the, the funds that it takes and the energy and resources that it, that it takes to have 51% of the computing power you know, for the entire blockchain, you basically have the rest of the world running against you. 
So even if you were a country that was like, okay, our country's going to overtake the Bitcoin blockchain, you're still going against all the other countries in the world. So it, it gets to be very difficult. Is it impossible? You know, not totally. Like in theory, it is possible, but it's very highly improbable if the Chinese government wanted to. Would you, would you be able to identify that? Mm -hmm. You what? Wouldn't you be able to identify that was happening at the time? Or would it... Yeah, I mean, you'd be able to see that there's, you know, kind of a fork that's occurring, and you would have, uh, you'd be able to see, like, okay, great. My balance over here is blank, and my balance over here is different. Why? And then, you know, you'd be able to pretty quickly tell, okay, great. Someone's trying to hijack the network. Yeah, I don't know if it's just me, but it just seems that to a certain extent, um, <coughs> the system seems to work ideally with smaller amounts because it, you're, you're right there. Obviously, that you that need large resources to steal, steal, oh, hijack, steal, whatever, hijack yeah. huge amounts of money. Actually, yeah. it would be worth it, but for small amounts, it's not. Yeah, I mean. You, you also have to consider like uh, how much how much physical machines are currently running. Like let's say you and I just had unlimited resources, and we're like, great, let's go let's go hijack the Bitcoin blockchain. You know, just for fun. Um, we would have to buy that many computers, which who knows if there's even enough supply to where you and I could buy today enough computers and enough computing power to outweigh the whole rest of the world on it. You know, there is a supply of the actual physical machines that, that do it. Uh, like nowadays, there's there's uh, computers that are dedicated solely to mining. Um, and uh, a good friend of mine you know, bought a bunch of them. Uh, I think he bought like 100 of these you know, machines that are just dedicated towards mining Bitcoin. Uh, he bought 100 of them. 50 of them arrived. The other 50 are on back order. Um, and so he had to wait another two months before he could get the next one. But there is, you know, a bit of a supply and demand that occurs with uh, the actual physical machinery. Did he, did he hold off the, remit, the second half uh, in order just to make sure that he was not going to be overwhelmed? Uh, is this a security issue? Um, no, he didn't. He, he already had a, a, there's, you know, so the networks of computers are called miners. He, uh, he has a, what's known as a mining farm. We're just a warehouse out in Washington, because Washington has really good energy rates. Uh, true story. Um, and he just put all of his computers in this warehouse, turned on the ventilation because they get super hot. They're very loud because they're, it's just a computer that's running at full power. And then so he just turns all these computers on and lets, lets it mine with Bitcoin. But I mean, there's an inherent vulnerability early in a chain's history. Yes. So you try to get adoption. Exactly. Yeah, potentially you're at risk of someone being able to. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine that if we in this room started a blockchain today, we just <clears> make <throat> our own, you know, Tech Talk May 18th blockchain for whatever reason. Um, and, you know, four of us were the people that were mining and supporting it. You could essentially have five people from the room next door come over with greater computer, computer power and they would just overtake our blockchain. But if you had everyone in Portland that was mining, you know, our blockchain together, um, then you would need to have another whole city's worth of computing power to overtake our blockchain. So the larger the larger the network and the larger the support system, the more, uh, or I guess, the tougher it is for it to be hijacked. Yeah. So one of the challenges that you see so much happening will be the those buying a house, car buying kind of thing, or buying a flight ticket. And then you can apply this technology to so many different uh, scenarios. What are the challenges uh, actually getting that implemented? Is it people's, uh, you know, adaptability for new technology, or is it not even people able to uh, support the contract writing system? Yeah, it's a good good question. Uh, this is this is going to be my opinion. This isn't like this isn't fact. This is Derek's. Uh, and it, it comes into a, a couple of different things. One, it's a very technical field. The amount of people that actually understand this is very, very limited. Uh, the amount of people that I know that work in the blockchain space that know what they're talking about is still very limited. And there's tons of people who are just like, woo, cryptocurrency, I'm making tons of money, this is great. How does it work? I have no clue, but I'm making tons of money, right? Those people, unfortunately, don't know a whole lot about how 
the, the technology itself works. So the field needs more people who are developing and more people who know how to, how to make it work. Um, that's one huge barrier. Uh, in addition to that, there's the implementation and adoption. You know, in the example of having uh, your health insurance be something that's written just with smart contracts, you know, that's all fine and great, and private practitioners would love that. But how do you actually get an insurance company to say, yeah, we're cool with that? You know, because maybe they want to have the ability to say, nope, I don't want to pay that, I don't want to pay that. Um, and so you have to find something that's workable, and you actually have to get it implemented. Um, so the implementation and, and adoption is, uh, is a huge uh, barrier that needs to be overcome with this, uh, with this technology. A lot of people get very focused on, you know, what is the price of Bitcoin, uh, or what is the price of one ether, uh, when, you know, that's not, that's not what the technology was originally built for. It was built for figuring out ways to automate processes like buying a house or all these other things. So kind of, kind of a, a long answer, but I would say having enough developers and having enough people building things that are useful is a huge part. In addition to that. You know, getting more people to use things that are within that field, and the two go hand in hand. Yeah, you mentioned earlier. Change the subject a little bit. You mentioned earlier about on Coinbase how they will track um, transactions on their own database. Yeah. How does that work? Then don't they have to? Would they have to then update onto the blockchain with their current balances? Uh, good question. Um, uh, I'll see if I can I can draw this in a coherent way. Um, so essentially, um, on the let's say that this is a Bitcoin ledger, right? On the Bitcoin ledger, it could have me, it could have Bob, and it has Coinbase. Now it doesn't look like this. You don't see my name on the blockchain. Instead, you see letters and numbers. But when you know, let's say I were to send you funds to your Coinbase account. I don't actually send funds to your Coin, Coinbase account. I send funds to Coinbase. And Coinbase recognizes, oh, hey, that address belongs to you. So we're going we're gonna to credit your account within our database, those funds. Now, if you wanted to send funds to me, Coinbase actually sends funds. Yeah, 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 and that's, you know, there's differences between uh, an online wallet, which is what that would be, and then an offline wallet, where you hold all the keys and access to your wallet. Uh, there's benefits and there's, uh, you know, downsides to both. Uh, the nice thing is that that's very fast and you can, you can make things occur quickly. Like, if you wanted to send me uh, one Bitcoin using Coinbase and we both had Coinbase accounts, I could have access to it instantly because it's just a quick database transfer on their side. Um, if uh, if you wanted to send it through the blockchain, it would take at least 10 minutes for me to get it. Um, and we could do it, if it's all in an internal database, we can do it where there's no fees. Because it's not actually being broadcasted to the network. So what Coinbase is putting on the blockchain is just their total balance. Right? Yeah, and there's probably Coinbase 1 and Coinbase 2. Uh, well, that's what To where they have multiple addresses, and it's up to them and their, you know, their security team and all of that to figure out how they want to manage things and make sure that, you know, that someone doesn't get access to point so they have to secure the data on their end, yeah. like on in their database. Yeah, and there's a whole field, you know, dedicated to information security and figuring out how do we make, how do we make this secure so that it doesn't get hacked. And you know, uh, I I never worked at Coinbase. I just know from having, you know. Building my own, you know, because crypto vault is essentially the same thing as Coinbase, except we plan on supporting a lot more currencies than they do. Um, but I know from reverse engineering it, like, okay, how does this work? Uh, if you were to look at your public address coming from Coinbase uh, and you were to run a scan on it on the blockchain, you don't actually see the funds ever coming in uh, because they're, those funds are uh, were sent to a different address. It's just all stored within the Coinbase database. So your coin vaults, right? It's crypto vault, yeah. Uh -huh. Crypto vault. Is that an offline or online? We want to offer both. Um, the nice thing about offline storage is that you can uh, keep your private keys wherever you want. 
Uh, the downside of that is if you lose your private keys, I don't have a way to access them, so that money is gone. Um, but you know, maybe someone wants to have an online wallet because they don't really care about storing their own private keys. You can do either way. So, so basically, Coinbase look like a bank. They can track all of your transactions, right? Mm -hmm. So, look like Bitcoin is not good because it's not anonymous. Because they will find out where your money go. Yeah, there's so, a lot of there's a, a lot of regulations going into uh, how all that works. Yeah. Um, you know, like for example, when you create a Coinbase account, you have to give them your name and your social security and your address and all this other information. Um, so if you were to send money in and out of your Coinbase account, then obviously it's verifiable that that money came in and out of your hands. Uh, you could very easily just create a unique address using a totally different wallet system where it's not linked to your name. But because Coinbase is you know, a company that wants to work within the laws of the land, yeah. you know, they, they have to be, be um, compliant with uh, AML or anti-money laundering policies and know your customer policies. So they refrain like uh, money laundering or something like that? Yeah, I mean they do that to prevent money laundering. Oh. Yeah. So you, you work with Coinbase, you look like you work with the bank. They yeah, know. I mean, yeah, similar. Okay, cool. Any other questions? Okay, good. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap this up. I'll be around for a little bit here, so if you wanted to ask any one-on-one -on -one questions or anything specific to me, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, otherwise, thank you guys for coming, and uh, I'm sure we'll see you guys around at future Tech Talks. Oh, hi, I have a question. Yeah. Can you write your company on the board? So yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I do upstairs. Um, yeah, or you can uh, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. I can look at the Okay, yeah, perfect. Cool. Do you know if semantically you can like dynamically create smart contracts? Like I have a I have a machine learning model that scours the web for cars uh -huh. and predicts kind of the depreciation for used cars uh -huh. and then manually emails them. But could I dynamically create contracts? So send out, you know, I notice that these Porsches in the next, you know, month are gonna appreciate by a certain amount. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna send out all these contracts to these people. Three of them get rejected, one of them's accepted, mm -hmm. and then bring that back manually to me to approve it. Can you like generate contracts? Like, yeah, programmatically I'm, without I'm, you. I'm sure you could. Um, without you, you know, physically coding it, I don't know exactly how that would work. Or set like a, a template, give it to your model, and then it populates it with. Yeah. Kind of, yeah. So you can create a template, and then yeah. you know, like. Um, I'm guessing that's what like big companies would do, like insurance companies or even like a hospital for the yeah. same procedure. They wouldn't have someone manually enter it. They yeah. generate them based off templates, you know, for... Yeah, exactly. So like we could have, you know, uh, this is kind of a bad example, but you could have this as a template. If blank occurs, then that. So you could say if, you know, insert, a, name, yeah, from insert name and insert vehicle identification yeah. number or insert whatever, then do blank. And so you could have the contract language already pre-written, yeah. but the specifics as to who and what within the contract uh, could be something that you could make, uh, you know, just brought into it. Yeah. Do you know if there are, if there are any limitations on generating them? Like if I generate 2,000 in a minute, do you know if there's anything limiting it? You know, not necessarily. Um, there is, each block has a certain size to it, yeah. so like you wouldn't be able to produce a trillion contracts in a second yeah. because there's not enough information stored in an individual block. Um, and then also just know that you know if you're going to be running large contracts all at the same time, that is going to cost you money to yeah. do so. Which everyone else is, is super pumped about because every, all the miners are getting the, the yeah. transaction fees for that. Until someone, someone could then reject my contract, right? That's the cancellation. Yeah. Once they receive it, they cancel it. I stop paying for them. But yeah. the problem is if they never cancel it, then it keeps running. Well, it until runs. In, it runs until um, you know. There's there's the concept of gas. So you put funds into the contract in order for it to operate. 
if the contract is running and it's yeah. just you know continually running, it's going to be using gas. And then if it runs out of gas, then the contract just freezes cool. until you put more gas into it. Cool. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, but like that, the example with the space invaders, mm -hmm. you know, there was a, a contract that was generated between my laptop and my phone, and every time I press left, it's sent to the network saying go back. Mm -hmm. And every time I said right, it's sent to the network go right. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I don't know if you heard Scott Galloway yesterday. He's an NYU professor. He talked about uh, the rise and fall of ICOs and um, how there's like an issue with now auditing who gets access to audit your purchases. Huh. Um, it's really cool. He just talked about it yesterday, actually. Okay, I'll um, check it out. Yeah, and there's a whole crazy boom with ICOs and things like that. Yeah, that that whole realm is a very interesting realm. Yeah. It's Have you ever crazy. participated in an ICO? Nope. I just watch okay. fire and stand on the sidelines. Yeah. Gotcha. It's just crazy. Speaking yeah. of ICO, I was curious if you're familiar with the NEM blockchain. You yeah. Think about it. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not as familiar with their protocol. I've, I've seen them a lot, and I know that it's, a, you know, it's reputable in a sense that it's, you know, been something that's uh, been around and they have a great development team, but I couldn't tell you specifics about how their blockchain differs from other blockchains. Yeah, I was just curious, because I just started an online class, okay. and um, they have Ethereum, which is very involved, mm -hmm. and they have a thing on NEM, which is much shorter, for now at least they're going to add to it. Okay. But it's shorter partly because it's really easy to use. Yeah. In fact, you can create your own cryptocurrency. Yeah. And I did. And yeah. It's a piece of cake. Yeah, you just make your own token. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to it. But if you wanted to do something like that on, on something like Ethereum, I don't even think you can do that on Ethereum. But yeah, no, you definitely can. Oh, you can. Yeah, I, I think it's quite involved, though, and it requires a lot more work. Yeah, and kind of the language, the language is slightly different. So, like, if you have... Um, you know, like Bitcoin is a coin. You, you'll also hear of some cryptocurrencies that are tokens. Right. Um, uh, like there's one token called uh, Augur, or the project's called Augur. Their token's called Rep. Um, but their token actually lives within the Ethereum blockchain. Oh, okay. And Ethereum is the, the coin oh, that of sense. that blockchain, but they have subcoins, which are just contracts that are, you know, adjusted and updated right. uh, for their token. Oh, I have a question. Thanks for the talk. Yeah, are you, absolutely. Uh, are you the founder of Kinto Ball? Yeah. Oh, so how long is this company? Uh, since August, we've been working. Really, oh. really, the backstory behind it is that you know I was using Coinbase for all of my purchases, oh. and I eventually got fed up with you know because I I personally uh, am holding around twenty different cryptocurrencies, and I was telling some of my friends about it. I'm like, yeah, you should really get it this one. And I'm like, great, how do I do that? And so I had to like physically walk them through creating an account on an exchange and you know how to transfer their funds from Coinbase over to this exchange and how to transfer it, you know, submitting a market order or a limit order or all the different things that go into an exchange. And I was like, if Coinbase just supported all these other currencies, it would be way easier. Uh, but over time they you know, they've gone from supporting just Bitcoin to supporting four, which is a great step. But um, after you after you supported one, and you have all the licensing necessary to do that, uh, supporting the rest is something that's fairly simple. Oh. So, so do you have the app? Do you have crypto wall? Yeah, we do. We do have a website right now. Um, currently, you can send and receive uh, Bitcoin. You can't buy or sell it on our website yet. Because uh, there's a lot of regulations that go in place, you know, in order to make sure that we're not just going to run away with our money. <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, and so we have to complete all of the same AML registration and know your customer policies and make sure that we have everything in place. That way, we're also not just forwarding, you know, money laundering. And then you, your company in Portland. Yeah. And you try to open the service similar to Coinbase. That's right. And then you will become an exchange or something. Yeah, the, and the, the terminology that's used currently is an exchange, but it's very different than like, you know, a stock exchange where you have, you know, an order book and people placing market and limit orders. This is one where you would just exchange, you know, U.S. dollars specifically for whatever cryptocurrency of your choice. So, so when I go to your website, I can buy some Bitcoin or uh, Ethereum, right? Yeah, you will be able to. Currently, you cannot because we don't have our licensing completed. Oh. So once once that is completed, 
then we turn things on and uh, you know it's something that has to be done in every state. So and then you advertise on the newspaper and all. Exactly. Oh, so where is your headquarter? Uh, right now, uh, we're located in this building. Oh, this one? Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. But it, right now, it's you know it's it's in the startup stage, and so there's you know it's it's me and there's uh, four other developers, and sometimes they work from home. Mm -hmm. And until we can actually buy and sell cryptocurrency, uh, we're not making any money off of it. Like oh. we have we have zero funds being made until we complete our, our registration. At that point, we can turn it on, and people can actually start buying things. We're selling things, and we would just charge a transaction fee whenever that happens. So your company look like Coinbase, uh, Gemini. Uh... Yeah, well, Gemini is more of an exchange platform. So on uh, Gemini, you have the ability to set market and limit orders, you know, stop losses, all that stuff. You see the order book, the price history, all that. Ours would be more similar to Coinbase, where you just say, "Great, I want to buy this much Bitcoin," and we say, "Great, here's the price." So, yeah, so it's not like you're going to be playing against a whole open market. The other thing is that on Gemini, you know, let's say, let's say I'm Gemini and you go to Gemini and you want to buy one Bitcoin. Your order would be matched with another Gemini user. Uh, so you guys, I would basically be providing a marketplace where you guys could exchange, you know, at whatever market price that you decide. Uh, but at Crypto Vault, you're not going to be dealing with other people, you're just going to be dealing directly. Uh, because in Conway they have a chain too. They have a GDAX. GDAX, and yeah. they run all of their um, they run all of their uh, transactions through GDAX. Yeah. yeah. Which wow. the other cool thing. Uh, let me turn off the live stream just so I don't get this on yeah. record. Oh, cool. So so later I can come to uh, yeah one thing here buy some coin. Yeah, one thing that we're gonna do. I just wanted to turn that out because I didn't want this necessarily broadcast into the internet yet. Yeah. Oh, cool. secret info. Yeah, <laughs> this, I'm like so excited about this. So, so Coinbase, they run their exchange through GDAX. So all of their orders get sent through that one exchange. Yeah. Now, if you look at the price of Bitcoin on GDAX, it might differ from the price on Bitrix or Gemini or any of these other exchanges. Yeah. So what we're going to do is we're not tied to any one exchange. We plan to go to all of the exchanges, and that way we can give our user base the best price. So if Coinbase is giving it at uh, 8500 and Gemini says 8300 and Bitrix says 8600 If you want to buy one, we'll give you the $8300 price. Cool. And if you want to sell one, we'll give you the $8600 price. Cool. So if your company you sell the price cheaper than for May, so people will go buy from you. Well, we're just going to, yeah, exactly. And that's yeah. part of our draw to why use us, is we want to get you the best price possible. Now, we're still going to charge you a transaction fee. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Uh, but we want to find you the best price. And because we're not linked to any one marketplace, we can pull from multiple marketplaces. Or maybe you can hook up uh, the miner your friend had in Washington. Yeah, I, I, talk, I talked to him about it. There isn't a whole lot of synergy necessarily. Yeah. Um, un unfortunately, like although we both work in the cryptocurrency and blockchain space, that's you know it's cool that we're both there, but it's not like. Yeah, exactly. I, I don't necessarily, it's not like he's going to, you know, mine only transactions coming from me. He's going to mine whatever is the most profitable for him. Uh, but he can sell to you, right? I mean, he could give me his Bitcoin if he wants. Yeah. I'm all fine with that. I don't think he wants to do that, though. No, he, he sell to you, and then you can sell in crypto ball. Yeah, he well, he sell you a cheaper price. Yeah, when he's mining his Bitcoin, he could sell that to crypto. Crypto ball, yeah, and um, and we could then sell that out to other people, yeah. but um, you know there wouldn't be that much of a benefit between him selling it to us other than the transaction. Like we could give him lower transaction fees, you know, if he's going to be doing uh, orders larger than you know fifty thousand per order. Isn't that theoretically possible? Where like I do have a farm, yeah. and like you have an agreement with them, I'll give you lower transaction fees if you prioritize my transactions. You know, I was looking into that. Apparently, A, really difficult. Yeah. You could do it, um, but it also doesn't really work to the miners' benefit. So yeah. it's to make because, the profit they can. yeah, because they're, you know, the transactions that they choose to mine are based off of an auction. So, if, you know, each of us send a transaction to 
Bitcoin network and you say, I'll pay a dollar, two dollars, three dollars, four dollars, you know, if someone comes to mine and they can fit only two more transactions worth of information, they're going to take the four dollars and the three dollars. Right. You know, for you to be like, hey, dude, sneak mine in there, yeah. he'd be like, cool, that's going to lose me money. <laughs> uh, are you going to pay me the difference? And then you wouldn't really have that much. Yeah, but at the same time, if, if it was one, like, if I was looking at this, because this is, this is something I was playing through my head, like, okay, so, you know, with Crypto Vault, do we eventually want to have a sister mining company that can mine Crypto Vault transactions specifically? Um, in theory, that sounds pretty cool, but at the same time, every time we're mining a Crypto Vault transaction, unless it is the, you know, the current auction price, like, if it's below the price of the other transactions, then the other company is losing money. So the only time where it would really be valuable is if there were just these insane wait times for a transaction to be confirmed. Which, you know, there have been times where that has occurred, but at the same time, that's easily avoidable by just increasing the amount that you're auctioning on your transaction. So we would currently, we would just say, great, pay an extra dollar on your mining fees and your transaction will be confirmed faster. So, uh, so your company, uh, do you have any kind of VC backup? Like in uh, San Francisco, they have like, yeah. bit, you know, like bid to you, somebody back up your company, do you like a yeah. couple of million dollars or something? <laughs> yeah, we actually, we have a couple of investors that are looking into it, uh, uh, but we don't have any you know, specific uh, VC money that's locked in place. Because uh, usually Portland, the new small place, yeah. So uh, yeah, no, the people that are looking into it are not yeah. Them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Most of the company uh, start up in uh, San Francisco, right? Yeah. 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 It's a huge yeah. area. San but Francisco, in, New York, uh, Seattle. Or something yeah. Like that. Yeah. Unfortunately, New York drove out a lot of their uh, blockchain-based companies. Oh. If you guys get a chance, there's a, a documentary on Netflix called Banking on Bitcoin. Super interesting. In, in, uh, in New York, summary version, and it's worth it to see the, the whole documentary because it gives you a really good idea of the history of Bitcoin and how, how it got to be where it is now. But um, uh, about a year back, or I don't, uh, a few years back, there was regulation put in place in the state of New York that if you wanted to be a Bitcoin based company, you had to apply for this thing called a Bit license. Yeah. And, that requires all kinds of different things. Like one of the things, one of the items on that is you have to have a CPA that's been working in the Bitcoin or blockchain space for at least three years. Which there's probably like three of them. And Coinbase has, Coinbase has two of them, right? Um, and so it makes it near impossible to you know, create that. Uh, but the guy who actually wrote the information that's on the bit license that you have to apply for. Right, he's working for the state, puts that through legislation, all that stuff, gets approved. After it gets approved, he's like, cool, I quit. Cool. I am now a Bitcoin consultant. Any companies can pay me tons of money. I will show you exactly how to get around all of this. Oh. Oh. I know the rules in and out because oh, no. I wrote that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. and they heard like Coinbay right now, they try to apply for the security license too. Yeah. Yeah, because they don't have the security license. It's it's smart too. That's that's one thing that you know that we're that we're looking at is you know with the amount of regulations that are going into place, like some of these are later being called a security when they were originally not a security. And if you were selling that, you can get hit with these nasty penalties. Yeah. So it's worth it to just go through the work of like, okay, we have our security screen in this case. It seems like that's where a lot of the volatility has come into play uncertainty as to how governments are going to interact with crypto if that's accurate or yeah and and personally you know different people have different takes on this some people are very free market like shift and adjust and it'll work itself out personally i think having you know some regulations in place help with the stability because then you know like you know that the volatility occurs with uncertainty but if everyone had certainty on this is how it works this is how it doesn't work. Okay. You know, then they would, you know, be able to, to fine tune exactly where it is, right? I mean, we've had a hundred years of the modern banking system with 
practice and moves and stuff, but regulating them to try to prevent that. But all that is make them help as much as we can for yeah, exactly. space. Um, so there yeah, are different parties who, yeah, the CFTC is kind of like, we should be in charge. The yeah. SEC is like, we should be in charge. Yeah. The IRS is like, we should be in charge. <laughs> Interesting to see how that plays oh, out. Yeah. I got a new look like Coinbase may apply for the banking license too. Yeah. Oh, should they be smart? Yeah, they will apply for everything. So there's banking clients, license. Yeah, I've got people who own crypto, and then there's miners, and then there's the exchanges. And so what is like Coinbase in crypto? Or what are, what cat category are you getting? You know, it's it's interesting, and I don't think there's a great term for it yet, and so I'm kind of I'm kind of creating my own term, which is a gateway. A gateway. Yeah. yeah, it's a gateway between fiat and cryptocurrency. There's an exchange platform where you know it creates a marketplace where people can exchange between each other. But that's not really what we do. Mm -hmm. We just offer a way for people to go from fiat currency into cryptocurrency. Oh. And so, uh, you are native Poland? You born in Poland? Uh, no, originally from San Diego. I oh. lived here for eight years. Though. Oh, you lived here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, of, one of the many people here from California. Yeah. 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 So the exchanges, what is is their function just to kind of coordinate transactions between miners and no, clients? An, an exchange is a marketplace where people can um, can you know trade with other people. Mm -hmm. Like the oh. three of you guys could trade. By going onto an exchange, and then one of you could say, like, I want to sell this, and someone else would be like, All right, I'll buy that, and then you guys transfer this to sell their peer to peer. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, if you go, if you came to my website, you would not do that. You would just be working directly with the right, right, right. Oh, cool. So, do you do uh, Solidity uh, programming language? Do, do I use Solidity? No, yeah. I'm actually one of the least.